Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending our Electric Heating Cable Products webinar. My name is Ed McMahon, the owner of Liberty Electric Products and Eastern Reliability. Now, before we get started, I just want to let everybody know that you'll be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions as we move along, go ahead and enter them into the questions panel uh, located in the webinar control panel, and then we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, if we don't have time to get through all the questions, we will be sure to re respond back to you via email. Also, we'll be recording this webinar and be posting it both um, the slide deck on our website and YouTube channel. And, and as you all know, this is a New York State PDH certified course. So if you check that box when you registered, you'll receive your certificate via email in about a week. And if you didn't check the box but you need the certificate, please go ahead and email uh, us your information and we'll make sure we get that out to you. Um, our presenter today is Rob Zrillo. Uh, Rob is our Heating and Ventilation Product Manager here at Liberty Electric Sales. Uh, he's been with Liberty Electric for over 10 years, and he's been in the heating business for all of his 25-year career. He's been involved in the design, engineering, and installation of well over 500 heat trace jobs of all different types of application, as well as last year he did 75 in-person PDH classes on site. Our goal here today is not only to provide the PDH credit that's required by the State of New York, but to provide you with some more technical information on snow melting, pipe trays, roof and gutter installations, and introduce some new products uh, that will help everyone when designing these types of systems. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Rob. Thank you, Ed. Um, thanks very much, folks, for uh, attending this. Uh, for any of you people that have uh, seen this presentation a couple years ago, welcome back. There is some new content which will be uh, exciting, stimulating for all you folks that have not attended this before. Uh, we try to do our best to make uh, heat cable as exciting as we can. So <laughs> uh, without further ado, let's get rolling into this. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, background on our agency, uh, Liberty Electric is in its 33rd year and uh, we cover all of upstate New York and we really cut our teeth you know, originally on electric heat applications. I mean, since then, you know, we've been in growth mode. I mean, these past five years have been very exciting for us. We've expanded by integrating in three other uh, rep agencies into the fold. And uh, as you can read along here, we now total around 50 lines. Uh, the main brick and mortar office is located in Syracuse. And uh, we've got five outside salespeople, uh, eight inside. And, uh, you know, we really try hard to get your, you know, to get service back to you guys. I mean, when you've got questions, you need help either specifying technical support uh, we do pride ourselves on uh, getting back to you as quickly and accurately as we can. Um, you know, our audience has, has grown. Uh, we, we, we really encompass pretty much every type of account there is out there at this point, aside from, uh, from residential application. But that's not to say that, hey, you know, some of these products will work, especially in this presentation, in residential applications. And uh, if you ever need help with those, please don't hesitate to contact us. So... I'm not going to talk much about myself. Ed already did a nice job of, of, of blowing my head up here in the introduction. So uh, all I can say is that, yes, I, I've been on literally probably thousands of job sites at this point, you know, industrial facilities. I've seen a lot of different applications on both the mechanical and electrical side, um, you know, and really, at least as far as, uh, as far as what I try to do out there is really just come up with good solutions for people that are both logical and economical. Uh, Trisha is our operations manager, and she's been at Liberty Electric for a very long time, as you can see, at 18 years. And uh, really, she runs she runs the uh, the staff. Okay, so she's in charge of getting your answers back to you, uh, or getting you pointed in the right direction to one of our experts that can uh, help you. Okay, uh, Ed Jordan, he is our uh, electric heat cable guru. Uh, he's a, he's our engineer who basically does design. Uh, quotations, you know, helps with technical information as well. And, uh, you know, Ed's got a background in engineering, which is a huge help and, uh, you know, really sharp guy. So if you need some help and you got to get a hold of somebody, Ed Jordan is your go to. So here's our outline for today. We're going to be covering the three most popular types of heat cable that we see in, in these commercial industrial applications. We're also going to go through our most popular applications, including roof and gutter de icing. Uh, sidewalk or slab snow melting, pipe tracing, fire sprinkler, as you can see, and grease flow pr protection. Low voltage systems is a new uh, topic that we're covering in this uh, presentation as well. We've got some great information about some uh, information 
we're very excited about with low voltage systems. And then we're gonna go through some of the controls, okay? The controls literally could eat up uh, a two hour discussion just by themselves, but we're really just gonna to touch on the basics and, and what you need to know, uh, you know, when looking at these heat cable applications. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, specifying and installation protocols. Okay, so let's get into the uh, different types of heat cable. So our main, uh, most popular is self-regulating. Uh, most of you folks have probably heard of this cable before out there. I mean, self-regulating cable is very popular because it is the one heat cable that it can touch against itself without destroying itself. So this is, you know, a very popular choice in pipe tracing and roof and gutter de-icing. It is a variable heat or wattage output product that we're gonna get into how that works next, okay? Can be field spliceable, connected, uh, you know, this is something that's relatively easy to work with out in the field. Um, constant watt cable is exactly what it says it is. A constant watt cable is going to give you a consistent wattage output based on how the cable is engineered. And we're going to get a little bit into the construction of this cable as well and what its advantages and disadvantages are uh, in, the, in the marketplace. The mineral insulated cable is a constant watt cable. It's a little bit of a different animal. This thing is constructed a lot like a tubular heater. Uh, it's a very specific product that gets engineered and built custom per application. It's actually a very versatile cable. Uh, we're going to get into a couple of uh, things that we've done with this particular product in the past uh, and, and hopefully, you know, broaden your horizons a little bit more as to, as to the potential of a product like this in the future. Okay, so getting into self-regulating cable. The first thing I'd like to start off with is, is self-regulating cable, there's an industry standard okay and and how we rate these cables and that's taken from a 50 degree f temperature okay so when we when a manufacturer has a product that say is rated for five watts a foot or eight watts a foot 10 watts a foot that's what the cable is going to deliver at a 50 f temperature okay so that's an industry standard across the board the output of the cable itself really is is dependent on a couple of factors what the temperature is of the surface that it is up against okay and what the content is of irradiated carbon or electroconductive material in that carbon mastic that will dictate its output and we're going to get into this in, in another slide here uh, very quickly but this is a great product that's safe to use on pretty much any material and that's what makes it so popular and because it's a variable wattage cable it does offer the best energy savings out of any of the uh, out of between a self-regulating or a constant watt cable choice um, you know, this one can pick you up some energy in the long run. Uh, the low temp self-regulating cable is, is what you're going to see for probably 99% of self-regulating cable applications. Low temp cable works up to a maximum of 150F. It typically destroys itself at around 180. So this makes it acceptable to use on EPDM roofs, asphalt shingle roofs, any PVC based pipes. Uh, this is generally a very safe product to use for those, but it gets its name really from its expansion and contraction properties, okay? So when we look at the, the construction of a self-regulating cable, if we were to cut and strip this cable back, this is basically what you're going to see. Now, because it's a black and white picture, it doesn't really do justice to the irradiated carbon versus primary over jacket, but in between these 12 gauge bus wires, we've got this black they call it carbon black or irradiated carbon that binds these two bus wires together and that's really where all the the magic happens okay on this particular cable and the flexing action the primary over jacket is something to note as well and we're going to get into that on the next slide as to how it confines the wattage output from going too far down it really doesn't put out much less than what it's rated to put out because of that primary over jacket it doesn't allow the, the mastic to expand out very far and then you've got a tin copper overbraid for both protection purposes and it also is a grounding measure when we braid this uh when you strip this cable back you can actually wind up the tin copper overbraid and use it as your ground wire okay uh, the outer jacket is going to be either a uv chemical resistant or some manufacturers are able to integrate both into the outer jacket so it has both properties whether you use it for pipe trace or roof and gutter de-icing applications um, okay, so when we look at how this cable works through expansion and contraction, okay, 
we put this cable against a cold surface as things typically like to do when we freeze them or make them cold is they become compact. They want to pull themselves in closer together and become more dense. This cable, you could say basically microscopically changes its state and begins to pull itself together a little closer. And as those bus wires get closer, it opens up more electroconductive pathways to create that resistance which ramps up your heat output so the colder the surface is that this cable is up against the warmer it delivers okay uh, when we put this against a warm surface just the opposite begins to happen as we do when we make things warm it, it wants to expand and it starts to push itself away from from uh, uh, as it pushes the two bus wires apart from each other your wattage output begins to diminish or throttle down now the inner jacket remember we were talking about this is that inner jacket is tight enough to where it does not allow that carbon to expand very far. So if we had, say, a five watt a foot cable and we put it up against a surface like a hot asphalt shingle roof in the sunlight, I mean, you might have 30 degrees outside, but the surface temperature of that asphalt shingle could be 70. Uh, it will not allow it to really go all the way down to, say, two and a half watts output on a five watt a foot cable because of that primary jacket. Okay, so I, I want everybody to understand that is, you know, you might get a five watt, cave, five watt a foot cable to, to, to diminish its output down to four watts a foot, but you're not going to go much below that. A five watt a foot cable, conversely, on the other end, can go all the way up to a maximum of 12 watt a foot output if it is cold enough or during the initial inrush current. Okay, so when we look at self-regulating circuits, it's very important to note what that maximum wattage output of the cable can potentially be. We have inrush current issues to worry about sometimes where you get that initial surge of energy, which spikes the wattage output of the cable for a split second. So to avoid nuisance trips, we, we calculate out what's the potential of wattage draw on that cable versus what the amperage of the circuit is gonna be. And what I've provided here is a, is a reference on the left side, you can see this chart where most manufacturers are going to have a spec sheet that's going to give you a circuit length not to exceed and what their cable is rated for. And based on a 30 amp breaker, which we can't always go two pole for 120 or 277, these will give you the footage maximums of what we're talking about here is that uh, when we look at 275 feet, let's say on a 120 volt circuit, if you take 275 and times that by 12 watts a foot, Okay, and then divide it by your voltage, you're going to come out around 22 and a half, 23 amps, which per NEC code, we can't exceed 80% rated duty of the breaker. So for any of the electrical folks out there right now, you know, that's, that's how this whole system works. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, that's fine too. It's just knowing that we, we, we can't overload that circuit for in the event that, you know, uh, we get that inrush current or for whatever reason, we get an apocalyptic storm to where you know your heat cable is, is pushing out its maximum wattage output, we don't want to nuisance trip those breakers, okay? Um, when we look at life expectancy of this cable, most of the self-regulating cable that we see up here, you know, across pretty much all the brands, you're, you're probably looking at a life expectancy of around 10 to 15 years. This can vary based on the quality of the cable, uh, how much carbon content or irradiated, you know, mastic they've got in there, the, 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 the ingredients that they're using, because they do vary. And there's not a whole lot of information on figuring out people's particular mixture. But on average, this flexing action over time can lead to diminishing wattage output and the cable can start to, to degrade over that, you know, 10, 15 year period where maybe you go out to 20 years and your five watt a foot cable now only puts out about two and a half watts a foot. So it's time to, to get it changed out, okay? Uh, the higher the voltage is, the more it tends to accelerate this wear factor, okay? But don't let that scare you, is that higher voltages also help self-regulating cables run a little bit hotter. So if you're using it for something like, say, roof and gutter de-icing, we like the idea of running slightly hotter maybe than what the cable would normally put out because it melts the snow faster, you know, clears water off the roof faster. Um, so there are some advantages to that. Most self-regulating cables are designed for voltages 277 or below. There are a few specialties out there where, you know, there are a few that are 480 volt uh, usable, but they are very specific applications. Um, 
you know, there's one that actually can be used for snow melting sidewalks. Uh, it's pretty uncommon. So most of what you're going to find out there is going to be rated 277 or below. The final note on this slide regarding the end seals themselves, when we, when we install this cable out in the field, there's always the, the, a beginning and an end point. Okay, so we've got a power connection on one side of this cable and the end seal on the other. Uh, I've got that in there as a note because we really don't want these cables to sit submerged in a puddle, let's say, or down in a catch basin uh, coming off a downspout for extended periods of time. The cable can certainly handle water. That's no problem. That's, that's really what its primary function is, to roll water off of it. Okay, but we just don't want that, that end seal itself sticking down the puddle. I mean, as, as most of you folks know, if, if you give it long enough, water will find a way in and, uh, and short the cable out. So uh, the quality of these end seals and terminations is also uh, very important. So constant lock cable. Okay, constant lock cable is exactly what it says it is. And the ratings on these cable are again, you know, industry standard and you can have, uh, you know, three watt a foot, four watt a foot, five, all the way up to, you know, uh, 20 watt a foot if you want to, okay. This stuff will deliver a constant wattage output. So we don't have so much concern when sizing circuits with this cable because the math is easy. If you've got an eight watt a foot cable, X amount of feet divided by your voltage and, you know, you'll know how much you can put onto that circuit. Okay, this cable is actually a little bit uh, more basically constructed than even our self-regulating cable is. It's really just two bus wires with a 37 gauge nichrome wire that gets wrapped around them that creates the resistance and the heat output. Uh, what I do think is interesting though, is that you know the gauge of that nichrome wire is only, it's a 37. I mean, that's, that's thinner than dental floss. Okay, and this stuff is able to handle 480 volts. So, Pretty impressive, you know. It's it's got a, a life expectancy that definitely rivals self-regulating cable. Um, the stuff is very easy to work with. It's malleable, and and when you cut it, it's, it's it's easy stuff to splice. The thing about this cable, however, is that you cannot let it touch against itself, which confines its applications a lot more than something like self-regulating wood. This cable also runs considerably hotter, or can run considerably hotter. So as you can see, you can get up to about a max of 320 F output but it can sustain temperatures up to 390, which is you know, great for say condensate return lines, uh, something where you've got you know, high heat against the surface of the cable itself. So uh, this, this type of cable is typically used more in, in, in pipe trace applications or frost heat prevention. So when we look at the anatomy of this cable, uh, we're just gonna re-review this very quickly, but you know, again, nothing really complicated here. Um, you know, we've got two bus wires here, the primary over jacket and resistance wire. And then the over jacketing again, you know, is very similar to a self reg where you've got a chemical or UV resistant. The nice thing about constant lock cables is again, there's no inrush current with these. Um, you know, they don't spike like a self regulating cable can on startup. So, uh, because they're also easy to install, um, you know, these are great choices for things where we don't have to worry so much about cables touching against themselves like floor warming kits. Uh, they can be used uh, as snow melting uh, cables as well. There's a lot of constant watt cable that's used for these floor warming and snow melting applications. Okay, mineral insulated cable. This is a, it's a constant watt cable by nature. Okay, so when we're, we're figuring output and sizing breakers, it's no different. This cable, however, is manufactured specifically to the application, to the wattage output you're looking for, the length. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into this particular cable. The plus to it is that it's extremely robust. I mean, this is a 30 plus year cable. So if you're looking for an application where, they, where you like to design in some permanence, let's say, uh, this is a great cable to use. It's, the, it's an inflexible cable, okay? This, this really actually, the action of this cable is a lot like bending a tubular element. There's literally 100% memory to this cable. When you bend it, it's, it, it stays in that shape. So that can be a good thing uh, if we're trying to, you know, conform it to different objects and we want it to stay, but it can also be tough to work with too, because obviously keeping it in contact with the surface you're trying to heat or offset, you know, can be a challenge at times. This is another, you know, instance where this cable cannot be allowed to touch against itself. It will burn through. Um, you know, certainly lower wattages. I mean, if you were to have a cable designed at say four or five watts a foot, you know, certainly not recommended. I think the threat of it burning through is a lot, lot less than say something that might be 25 watts a foot for 
sidewalk snow melting where you would be guaranteed it would, it would burn through itself if it was in contact with itself. So the sheathing on this particular cable uh, is mainly copper. That's what you're gonna see about 85, 90% of the time or stainless steel. Uh, obviously, you know, being a specialty niche product, um, you know, the, the stainless steel version of this cable is really meant more, I think, in industrial applications with tank heating, um, sump pits, you know, things like that, de-icing where you could have the threat of caustics. Um, typically with concrete immersion, you're going to see a copper sheath uh, cable covered with an HDPE jacketing on it, okay? These cables are also single or two conductor, and by single conductor, you'll see a power lead coming out of each end of the cable. Okay, those two power leads have to be connected back to the power source to complete the circuit and allow the cable to heat. A two conductor cable is really nice because it's got a pre-welded end seal on the finished end of it, let's say, okay, which we can also have a pulling eye put on that. And then your two pigtail leads that come off that or your two power leads can be just directly connected to your power source and you don't have to worry about bringing the cable back upon itself. The voltage range is, is also very wide with this cable uh, from a 120 to 600 volt. And as you can see, the temperatures that these things are able to withstand or put out can be very high depending on how you engineer the cable, okay? All right, so when we look at the cut for MI cable construction, you know, again, we're looking at basically a tubular heater. We've got two conductors inside of there wrapped in a magnesium oxide insulator. So if you crack this cable open, you're gonna see powder, white powder come out of this cable. Um, it's wrapped in a uh, copper sheath or stainless steel sheath. And then the HDP jacketing is, is, is basically optional, okay? Um, we usually use that particular uh, uh, option on the cable to, to keep it intact during concrete immersion pours because the uh, the chemicals that are used to help cure that concrete faster can attack and oxidize the copper sheath of the cable. So, you know, it's really just meant there uh, to just protect it temporarily. And also in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, you can see that single conductor assembly with, with a pigtail a power lead sticking out of each end of it. So uh, that gives you a little bit better visual. The, the picture below here where we've got a condolet on it, that's a two conductor cable where you can see the two power leads sticking out of uh, just the one end of the condolet. So MI cable is a very robust, durable type of product. I mean, this is something where typically it's a one and done installation. You know, and again, being able to customize your wattage output uh, really makes it, you know, uh, a kind of an exciting cable, I guess you could say, in terms of being able to dial it right into your exact application. The tough thing about them is that this is not the type of cable that you can cut and splice and add on to in the field and, oh, geez, we mismeasured this thing and we got to add 20 feet more to it. Uh, that's not an option out in the field. I mean, this stuff is, again, manufactured to a specific length. It is welded on each end of it. And during production, we actually submerge these cables in a, in a water tank, a hydrostatic test uh, that has to go for 24 hours before this thing can leave as a UL listed product. So uh, again, a lot goes into the construction of this cable, um, but if engineered correctly on the front side, it's a great product. All right, flat polymer heaters. This is new also to the presentation. Um, this is a, a really unique type of product that is basically, uh, for lack of a better term, almost like a self-regulating sheet of elements. So these can come in, in varying widths from three to 12 inches. And this is a, a, a semi-conductive self-regulating polymer that works exactly the same way we just talked about self-regulating cable. It gets warmer as you put it against a colder surface and it begins to back itself down again as it gets uh, against the warmer surface. So basically what, what, what you've got here is a, an element that as long as we don't go through the bus braids on each side and interrupt the power delivery to the element itself, this particular material can be stapled through, nailed through, screwed through, um, which really makes it you know, uh, an advantage during the installation period of it because Again, somebody, if they, if they accidentally damage the, the element itself, it's not gonna deter it from working. Um, so it really is a nice plus there as well. Okay, so we're gonna get into heat cable applications, um, get into the meat of the, of the presentation here. And roof and gutter de-icing is a very common application for heat cable. I know we've had some mild winters out there these past couple of years, but you know, really what this cable is there to do is prevent the ice dam, right? 
uh, sometimes there's a common misconception that if I put heat cable on my roof, it should melt it all clear. Uh, that's not really the case, okay? We're just trying to create melt pathways to get that water off of your roof, through the gutter, and down the downspout before it can refreeze and, and, and start damaging uh, the structure. So depending on what the roof structure is, there's different ways of doing this, okay? But self-regulating cable is a great option for this because, again, it can touch against itself without fear of it, you know, burning through. And uh, it's a relatively easy cable to work with on roofs. Um, the sawtoothing that you see on the, on the roof here in these two pictures, we're going to get into in the next slide here. So, but um, basically, it's not needed on every single roof. Okay, every roof is going to be a unique challenge, and one of the things that you know uh, dictates how much problem a roof can have, you know, a lot of times can be how much sunlight is is getting to that roof throughout the course of the day. I mean, I've been to uh, dozens of different buildings where. You know, if you've got trees shielding one half of that building, uh, you could have the greatest building and roofing materials in the world uh, up there on that roof. But if, if Mother Nature is not coming out and helping us accelerate the melt and the solar gain that the roof is getting, uh, you've always got that potential and that challenge of creating some melt water there naturally and then having it refreeze an ice dam up on that roof. So oftentimes it's, it's really a good insurance policy to help make sure that valleys and and gutters and, and downspouts are moving water smoothly off the roof. But when we look at the overhangs, this is really your, your, your greatest threat. Uh, this is where the most heat loss occurs on a building, is where the outer wall <clears throat> meets the roof. And in the older buildings where we don't have anywhere close to the insulation standards uh, or ventilation you know, that the newer buildings do, uh, where you see that red arrow coming down right there is definitely a major point of heat loss for that roof. So what happens is, you know, as warm air in the building is helping to accelerate the melt on the roof, that water comes trickling down and hits this unheated overhang, which is going to be ambient temperature outside. So if you've got a 20 degree day and water comes rolling down that roof, it can refreeze in seconds. And that's when the pain starts. Okay. So Typically, when we put a sawtoothing pattern up there, because there's a decent overhang, say a two foot overhang, and there's plenty of room for that water to refreeze, we need to run the cable at least a foot beyond that point. Okay, so that we're catching the water on the warm side of the roof and pathing it all the way down across the cold side and into the gutter before it can refreeze. When we're looking at metal roofs on the previous slide, uh, you can see the cable running in between the, the roofing ribs, and that's the way that we've we've always chosen to attack that application because self-regulating cable is, is not that easy to bend on a really tight radius. So making sure that it has good contact with the roof surface can be a challenge. It's a lot easier to run that cable as a sawtooth in between the middle the metal ribs versus trying to overlay it and come back down, you know, the side of the rib itself. Okay. Um, the last note on this slide I do want to address as well is in many cases, you know, you could be presented with a challenge when doing roof and gutter jobs as you've got multiple downspouts down the side of the building. You know, there's two schools of thought. Do I make a splice there and just run a single cable down that downspout or do I keep a continuous run and go down and up the downspout and continue on my way, you know, um, and we've always been proponents of the less splices you've got in your system, the better off you are. I mean, each one of those splices really has to be done very accurately and should be tested, you know, uh, after doing so to ensure that you've got proper continuity and proper voltage going through that newly added piece of cable. Um, a lot of times it's less time and money to actually run the cable down the downspout and come back up it and just continue your circuit on because there's no threat of this cable burning through itself. Okay, so uh, the time that it takes you to pull off a really good splice, test it, you know, um, is that generally it, it, it's, it's either a six to one half to the uh, half dozen to the other, or you're actually saving money by just making it easy on yourself and going down and back. Okay. Oops. All right, so here's a, an illustration that depicts what we were talking about just a minute ago of how warm air can rise up through a building. I mean, again, this, this applies more to your, your older structures out there, but uh, I think this helps put a, an image to the words. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So a lot of times I think that, you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, attributing factors to ice dams, it really is the, the sunlight. Okay, it's, it's, it's a lot of gables, 
dormers, you know, structures on that roof that may be preventing sunlight from getting into some of those nooks and crannies. And then, you know, you're really only getting a poke of, uh, of melt in there for about a half hour to an hour and a half or maybe two hours a day. And that may not be enough to clear it. So again, strategically placing cables where you've got uh, a more aggressive accumulation or it's melting slower in those areas is a great way to, uh, again, uh, protect your roofing materials. I mean, even on a new build, I mean, you've got a lot of money in roofing materials up there and it does not take long for ice to damage that. So when we're looking at these applications as well, just a few things that I've got here on the bottom of the slide to consider. You know, uh, the higher the voltage we can typically go up to 277, the better off you are because it's fewer circuits. So it's less room in your entrance panel or your service panel that's being taken. What type of roofing material is critical as well? Um, it's going to dictate, you know, the layout of the cable, especially when you get down near the roof edges and, and, and overhangs. And then, you know, of course, the downspouts themselves, yes, how many, what's the diameter, and how are they draining? Uh, you know, it's kind of critical during that installation period is that if you've got downspouts that are draining to underground catch basins, again, we don't want to leave an end seal stuck down in the water where it could be potentially submerged over time. So that's where we need to either do it down and up where we bring that cable back up and make sure that the end seal doesn't sit, you know, for prolonged periods in water, or is it going to drain out to ground level where we can simply run the cable out of the bottom of the downspout and, you know, put a little drip loop and then zip tie it to a, a downspout itself to just keep it protected. Um, all right, moving on. Here's a couple of pictures that we've got that depict uh, some pretty cool pictures, I think, because you can see on that upper left, it appears that the weather comes in from one side of this building. And, and I think that the installer who put these down, you can see some pretty deliberate melt lines coming down on the right side of each one of those dormers. So just to give you folks an idea, again, is that it's not meant to totally make the roof bare, but it's just to path waters around these obstruction areas that, you know, again, the sunlight may not be getting to as often. Uh, in the other upper right picture, you've got a nice scupper there that, you know, when we're doing flat roofs, it's important to create a, an area of melt around those scuppers, because if we just do a cable through it, uh, you know, just that drain hole or the scupper itself, everything around it wants to refreeze, and then it'll you know, prohibit water from getting into it. So, you know, whether you do a star pattern, flower pattern, it all works. The bottom right picture is actually uh, the low voltage system. It runs a strip of, you know, say 12 or 24 inches across the bottom drip edge of that roof and just keeps the lower portion of it completely cleared, which again, now if you've got melt going on in the upper half of the roof, it's got some place to go with the roof pitch is that that water will work its way down naturally. And then the bottom left is, is just a picture of showing downspout hangers in use, just keeping a couple of heat cables parallel in their run uh, down the downspout. It's not a requirement, but it, it certainly looks neat and tidy. All right, pavement snow melting. Pretty exciting application for heat cable here. Uh, there's a few different products that we use for it. Uh, we can use snow melt mats, MI cable, low voltage systems will all accomplish the goal here. Uh, I came from the hydronic world, so, you know, this is something that, again, was kind of a natural fit in seeing the advantages and disadvantages of both systems. And, you know, for a long time, electric always got kind of a bad rap because it was way too expensive to use. Well, the, the great thing about electric is that once we figure out what the total KW of the system is, okay, if we're doing, you know, uh, whatever, 100 square foot of sidewalk and, you know, we're figuring at 50 watts per square foot to melt it. I mean, the math and the computation to figure out your KWs and then times say 10 cents or 12 cents or whatever that KWH rate is that you're gonna know what the operation cost is of the electric system before you even, you know, before the customer even agrees to it at that point. So I like that, it's a nice feature. I mean, certainly for a hydronic system, you know, this is a great application for a condensing boiler. You know, you're bringing back low return water temps so it gives that boiler a chance to shine, but you're also always using electric to run circulator pumps to push that glide call, boiler sitting in low fire if it's not running in, in, in snow melt mode. So, you know, we're gonna go through some of these pluses and minuses uh, to both of, of, of these types of uh, solutions. Typically with us, you know, our, our biggest challenge with snow melting applications, if we're doing it conventionally with uh, constant lock cables or MI cable, it's how much power is available in the building. That's usually our biggest limiting factor is uh, there may not be um, 
you know, enough in the panel nearby to supply, you know, a, a larger system. I mean, certainly most sidewalks, entranceways, those are pretty easy. And the nice thing about this particular product or application is that you can go 208 up to 480. Um, certainly the higher the voltage you use, the less amps you're going to be tying up in your panel. So it does become a bit more efficient from a space perspective. Um, but up here uh, across the 90, we're typically engineering these systems to melt at about 45 to 50 watts a square foot, which is the equivalent on the hydronic side to your 150 to 160 BTUs per square foot. Okay, that's enough to keep up with two inches per hour falling. Uh, I mean, as soon as that snow's hitting, it's gone. Um, and typically our cable, what we're doing is designing it at say a 25, 26 watt foot on the cable, and then you turn it on a six inch radius to get your 45 or 50 watts a square foot. Okay, we do also uh, have mats <clears throat> and can engineer MI cable solutions for reduced wattage output when putting it under material like Tarvia, uh, parking lots, tarmac driveways, things like that, because that asphalt is going to be a lot, uh, it's going to be a lot softer than concrete is. So we don't want to hit that stuff with real high wattage cable. It can cook it and it can certainly disfigure, you know, uh, if you're running too hot under, under uh, Tarvia. Per NEC code, I believe that the code actually says that electric cable has to be at least an inch or an inch and a half below the surface. We recommend burying this cable around two to two, two to three inches in depth. I mean, really hitting it right on the buttons, about two and a half, two and three quarter. Um, we find that that really works best from the standpoint of if you bury a heat cable at a high wattage output too shallow to the surface, over time that heat can begin to fatigue the concrete. Okay, and we don't want it flaking off or creating visible marks in the concrete where you can actually see where the heating cables are heating from. Uh, if you bury it too low without something like an insulation board or something to help re-reflect your heat upward, it's just more mass you have to heat up. I mean, it'll certainly melt. You could bury an MI cable eight inches down. It's just gonna take a lot longer for that heat to come up through that concrete and, uh, and effectively melt. Most of these systems, um, actually almost all of them have automatic sensors. Same thing with our roof and gutter product. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that with that is that automatic systems will have sensors that detect both temperature and moisture. So criteria have to be met to automatically turn the system on. Uh, the controls for these systems will all also have manual override switch. So you can just simply go over and flip a switch and you know turn the system on uh, if you want to get it warmed up in anticipation of a big storm coming. Um, you know, or if uh, if the particular sensor itself in question didn't get hit directly with snowfall, but you got it on another side of the building, you can manually flip these systems on and, and, and you know, get your melt going. So uh, the bottom right picture there that you see is a pavement sensor, very similar to the hydronic systems as well. I mean, again, we're just looking for temperatures of 35 degrees or below and moisture present on the sensor to flip the system on automatically. The upper picture there uh, was actually a property in Buffalo uh, where you can see the, the, the cable being serpentined across that pore. I mean, it's, it's literally just that easy. Um, you know, one of the huge advantages to electric too is the labor time of install. So when we look at the components that, that really comprise this entire system, um, this is it. I mean, I tried my best to, to actually give you a pretty concise illustration here. Um, but it's a very basic system layout. I mean, you're simply coming out of a service panel with however many circuits you need to, to, to handle the melt design you've got into a contactor relay panel that's typically got, you know, a GFI, which is another code requirement for heat cables that we have to be GFI protected on our circuits. And you can accomplish that either with, with GFI breakers at the panel, you can do it with a contactor relay that has, uh, you know, GFI compliance in it. And then we're basically being told to turn on and off by a controller with a couple of sensors out in the field. So uh, when you look at this, I guess, by comparison to a hydronic system and, and all the moving parts within that system, I mean, there's not a ton of componentry, but the labor to do the wiring of this is definitely far less than all the fuel piping, the exhaust piping, uh, boiler maintenance, all those things that go into maintaining a hydronic system. Um, and I'm still not aware yet of a, of a fitting out there that's that's totally glycol tight. So, I mean, you know, after a few years of running that glycol system, you know, you may have to check that thing just to make sure you haven't had leaks on it. Whereas the electric system has no moving parts. There is no mechanical wear and tear. So once the system goes in, 
if it's working, it, you know, it's, it's, it's have a nice day for the next 30 years. I mean, this is a very, very consistent type of product. The other thing I really love about uh, the electric system by comparison is that we're not losing BTUs every time the system is activated. When you think about how glycol is coming out of the boiler at X temperature, like let's just say for the sake of the discussion, it's 100 degree glycol coming out of that boiler. And as it's going through that tubing and melting snow and that heat's being absorbed through the concrete, you're losing BTUs off it. So your glycol temperature is reducing every step of the way until as you come back, maybe that return water might be 20, 30 degrees less than what it was when it left the boiler. Okay. And again, I'm just speaking theoretical here. Whereas the electric system, you know, is going to be very consistent from start to finish. So our performance on the top of the concrete shows. We don't have the slushing on one end of it or seeing what we just kind of call speed bumps where you see like strips of snow in between where uh, the hydronic tubing was laid down where it didn't quite melt it all the way out. Yet. So, um, you know, we love the consistency of the electric product in that regard. And typically when we're melting at that 25, you know, watts a foot on the cable or 50 watts a square foot is that that's generating enough surface heat as well to also wick moisture off the concrete to prevent refreeze, you know, when the nighttime comes, let's say. So, um, so really slick advantage that the electric system has over hydronic in that way too. Um, as far as the sensors go, we like going with definitely at least one pavement sensor. You can use multiple sensors in the system, but we like attacking them with both a pavement sensor and an aerial sensor. And the reason for that is that once that can is cemented around in the in the concrete pour, it's not moving. So sensor placement becomes really critical. We want to make sure that wherever we put that, it's going to get hit with with snow. Uh, sometimes, depending on how the wind blows or you know factors that we can't control through Mother Nature. It can be a challenge at times, uh, or given the property design, um, you know, so therefore an aerial sensor is something that can actually be moved uh, to get you the best results, which is part of the reason why we started going with that, is that at least we've got some adjustability in the future to be able to move a secondary sensor. So when we look at, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty, I guess, in terms of, of, of comparison here. I mean, here's some things to really kind of consider is that, you know, material cost of it, if you have to uh, purchase a condensing boiler for your hydronic package, then I would say hands down the electric system is gonna be more cost competitive uh, overall. If you're talking about just putting in a shell and tube heat exchanger, because you can tap into a steam line, uh, I think that's good logic. It's just, you know, hey, if you've got a steam header that's 50 feet away, pop in a shell and tube heat exchanger and a couple of circulator pumps. I mean, you, you know, you've got a functioning hydronic system there. If you have to bring that pipe two or 300 feet away, you know, well, then maybe it's time to consider an electric system where you could have a service panel sitting 25 feet away from that entranceway or that sidewalk that you want to have heated. The labor costs, uh, there is no comparison there. I mean, an electric system for an installer that has uh, a, any familiarity with it and has done say a couple of these systems i mean there, there is absolutely no comparison there i would say that our installation is going to be minimum half the time if not a quarter of the time of what it would take to put in a hydronic system the operational cost was really interesting ashray actually did a study in 96 with a, a typical chicago winter where they took two i think they were 40 foot long sidewalks and uh, one of the manufacturers that we represent is has made light of this study on several occasions, you know, about how uh, the actual operational cost of these two systems was wildly different because over the period of that winter, the hydronic system accumulated over 1,300 hours of runtime because those circulator pumps had to keep rolling and they were always pulling energy somehow, some way. The electric system over the course of that same winter was under 300 hours of operation. So when you take your math and, you know, just figure out what your kwh rate was and what that actually cost the electric system was actually a lot more affordable to operate versus the hydronic system now i get it that was 1996 we've had a lot of changes in equipment since then but it's an interesting premise to consider uh, is that really our product doesn't have to continue running and say low fire and idle We're, we can be on or off or we can maintain a slab temperature if the user so desires uh, to make his melt a whole lot faster, let's say. Um, when it comes down to maintenance, again, there's really no comparison there. There's just, you know, uh, 
literally just cleaning off the sensor faces is about all you have to do and test your GFIs with the electric system. Um, when we look at the performance, uh, I really like the electric there too, because again, we're not losing BTUs along the way. So uh, there's a lot of good things about that electric system. It just has to be installed without damaging the cable. That's it. All right, pipe tracing, very popular application. Um, in pipe tracing applications, what we're really doing is preventing the heat loss off of the pipe itself. We're not directly heating any of the contents in the pipe. Uh, when you think about this for a second, you've got a massive, like say you're on a Schedule 40 or Schedule 80 pipe, you'd have to put out enough heat delivery to actually get through the skin of the pipe and affect whatever the material is inside the pipe at a particular flow rate. So to do that, you may need a, a lot of heat to do it, you know, and, and, and that's really not what our goal is here, is that all we're doing is offsetting the losses. So as you can imagine, it's like taking a hot plate of food outside on a 30 degree day. You know, if everything on your plate's 120 degrees and you take it outside in 30 degree weather, it doesn't take very long before your plate becomes 30 degrees too. Same concept here. So without installation, pipe trace cable is useless, okay? Um, we have to be able to hold that heat to the pipe itself. So you need both products in conjunction with each other. And what we do to figure this out is uh, there's a few factors just based on pipe diameter and how much insulation thickness we're going to wrap that pipe in that determines what our watt losses are on the pipe itself. And then we recommend the corresponding cable to offset that. So uh, say a two inch pipe with one inch of insulation, you know, you might have 4.14 watts of loss per foot on that pipe. Therefore, we would recommend, say, five watt a foot cable to counter that. So, um, so it's actually a pretty easy application. Uh, the big thing really is just, again, it's installation protocol. It's making sure that the cable uh, tests out at the end of the installation and that we're passing power and it's not leaking to ground. Uh, but just a few of these, you know, smaller tips for this application uh, like linear runs, okay? A lot of people are under the impression that you spiral wrap a pipe when you pipe trace it. You can, but you're gonna use a lot more cable length to accomplish that versus just using a linear straight run down the pipe itself. Um, most of the time, the pipes are not pressurized, okay? Which again, spiral wrapping can be wasteful because now you've got heat applied to the upper half of the pipe where there typically wouldn't be water or moisture, whatever the fluid is inside of the pipe. So a lot of times we're recommending to, to run that cable on the lower half of the pipe. It should be, if you imagine a clock face, somewhere between five and seven o'clock on the bottom of the pipe is optimal positioning for it. Now you can always use things like aluminum tape to help expand uh, your heat dissipation across the, the surface area of the pipe. Um, one of the things that I will also uh, note on here is that once you start getting in the pipe diameters over four inches, we need to start considering multiple runs because it's going to help balance that heat across the lower half of the pipe and prevent the freeze, which is what we're trying to do. Okay, so let's just say, for instance, we're dealing with a 12 inch diameter pipe. As you can imagine, one small width, you know, that's about the same as a, as a Romex cable, you know, one pass of self regulating heat cable is really not going to protect you very well on a 12 inch diameter pipe in one spot. So, in that particular case, if our watt losses, let's say, were 13.34 watts of, of loss per foot, we might take a five watt foot cable, let's say, and do three passes across the bottom half of that pipe to keep it freeze protected, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. All right, <clears throat> when we look at fire sprinkler heat tracing, it is literally the same as any sort of pipe tracing application that we do. The main differences with, with, with the fire applications is that a you obviously want to make sure that you're in compliance code wise with this but it's more how we're attacking the sprinkler head itself now that's about the best picture i could find for visualizing heat cable wrapped onto a sprinkler pipe now some manufacturers do try to actually get this little s turn up near your discharge nozzle where the actual sprinkler head is itself because as you can imagine where the brass and the steel uh, thread into each other right there. That's the area that everybody's concerned with freezing. However, you cannot by code impede the spray pattern of a sprinkler head. So it, it does require some finesse, you know, to properly install it, but the, the mechanics of the heat cable itself 
you know, is really no different than, than you know, what you'd be doing for a simple freeze protection in a water pipe. Grease waste. Um, grease waste is a, is a, is a pretty <laughs> niche application that really doesn't get thought about a whole lot out in the field. But boy, I'll tell you what, it gets thought about a whole lot when something breaks. Because um, if you've ever been by an exposed grease trap on a hot summer day, it, it, it's definitely a smell that you will never forget. Um, so that second pipe down is um, something you don't ever want to be confronted with on a job site if you could at all avoid it. Uh, this is the type of application where, again, a self-regulating cable works really well because most of the grease piping is going to be PVC based. So we don't want to have high temperature outputs that could potentially disfigure that piping or melt it. Um, but what I will say as well is that this is a great application to do redundant runs. Okay, so if you've got a 50 foot uh, pipe going into the ground, okay, it might be a great idea for you to consider putting two runs of heat trace cable on it, and then you're going to just end seal the spare cable, okay? Because after that pipe gets buried, you know, you're going to have runner crush on top of it and, and either concrete or, or tarmac or something. And if, if that cable dies, say, over 15 or 20 years worth of, of performance, the last thing you want to do is get an excavator and rip that all up to put in, you know, a, a heat cable at six bucks a foot you know, uh, and have to incur that kind of project cost where you can simply strip off an end seal, you know, rewire in your new cable and you're back in business again for another 15 to 20 years. So just something that's a, a good install tip when you're doing shorter runs like that, that are, uh, where the accessibility is a lot more challenging, um, you know, is to just double up those runs, okay? What I do think is pretty interesting uh, factoid about the, the grease application itself is that uh, grease, congeals, it, it, it stiffens up a lot higher temperature than something like water. Would. So, uh, you know, again, certainly folks in the food service industry understand this. And uh, again, th there's really no reason why grease waste lines shouldn't be traced is, is basically where I'm going with this. All right, low voltage system. Now this is a pretty slick application. I mean, this is a 3 sixteenths of an inch, or I'm sorry, 3 sixty-fourths of an inch thick. Uh, polymer okay this stuff is very flexible it can be cut and shaped um, when we're looking at low voltage systems when we're using it for say a roof and gutter de-icing project it's a product that would probably be best installed by the roofer and an electrician because this is going to go underneath the shingles themselves okay um, the beauty of a low voltage system is is that we're basically taking line voltage like 240 um, and putting it through a transformer and knocking it down to 24 volts. So what that does is it also takes away the GFI code requirement because now you're low voltage, so you don't have to have GFI breakers in the panel or some means of GFI protection in the controls. The other versatile, uh, versatile advantage, I should say, with these low voltage systems is that after the transforms are placed is that these these can actually be turned up and down you could say as far as their wattage output and delivery is concerned you may have to add more power sources to do it but you can throttle this this particular system to deliver uh say sidewalk melt or roof and gutter melting uh, by using very minimal wattage medium wattage let's say medium wattage consumption or you know to run on par with say something like a constant watt snow melt mat Generally, low voltage systems are going to use a third or two thirds less energy consumption than a standard, say, snow melt mat. Okay, so that's a it's a really nice advantage in that the the theory behind low voltage system is that it's going to take you longer to initially heat up the mass. Okay, so if we had this product in a sidewalk, uh, it may take you three four days, you know, or something like that. If you had this this this, this product buried down, say, five six inches into the concrete. Uh, it may take you several days to get it up to temperature, but once it's up to temperature, you can maintain it for very low energy. So now when the snow comes, it's just immediately melting off because you're just maintaining a mass temperature versus a sensor picks up on, you know, snow and moisture at a certain temperature and it closes the contacts, allows power to pass, and now you're hitting, you know, 50 watts a square foot into a sidewalk and melting it quickly, but it's it's using more power to do it in a shorter period of time. So uh, so the low voltage system is, is, is really a great option, especially for, uh, I would say like churches. You know, churches are always notoriously, they're older structures, 
they don't have, uh, most of them don't have electric upgraded electrical services. So, I mean, I've been in some of these older churches that were, you know, 1920s, 1930s, they've got a 100 amp, 208 single phase service. I mean, you, you're just not melting any significant portion of snow outside using a 50 watt a square foot system, uh, you know, for a property like that. But the low voltage system certainly gives us a really good option to uh, use less energy to, um, I guess, apply to, to a more diverse, uh, audience of structures that could use this kind of help. So uh, definitely something to consider. And, and, and the beauty of it, again, is I put that particular illustration in the upper right, where you can see nails getting driven through this thing, is that there's a lot less, I guess, chance, let's say, of installation error when it comes to destroying the element itself. As long as we don't cut into those two bus braids or sever those, which would, again, reduce voltage and current, to the mastic itself, which we can't have, that's really your only performance inhibitor here. Um, when this product goes in concrete, a lot of manufacturers will also encase this in like say a vinyl bag. Um, curing chemicals inside of the concrete are, are, are <laughs> it's really damaging stuff. So whenever we're doing a concrete immersion pour, the biggest thing is just making sure that that thing survives the, 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 the pour of the concrete itself and the drying process. Once that's happened, many times the, the sheathing of cables will burn right off or the spinal bag over time will just deteriorate and burn off and that's fine. It's just making sure that that chemical doesn't get a chance to start oxidizing or you know, uh, corroding the, the elements themselves. So low voltage systems, again, give us a lot of versatility. It's a, it's a very flexible and easy polymer. I mean, one of the other things too I wanna to mention with roof and gutter is that you can use this material and actually fold it right over the drip edge of a roof, which is really, really slick, okay? I mean, as we know, that's where a lot of the issues uh, start on a roof and gutter freeze up. And anytime you can keep that lower two, let's say, you know, two feet of the, of the roof, you know, handled, uh, then you know, obviously your performance stays in check. So, all right, so again, I'm sorry, we, we covered part of this slide already, uh, you know, in terms of the fact that it's a 24 volt low voltage power supply you know, uh, these strips are typically from three inch to 12 inch wide and they're only 364 thick. So it's a, it's a really easy product to work with there. And, uh, and again, the energy consumption is, 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 a, is a big advantage over, you know, normal uh, resistive heat products like, you know, constant wad mats or MI cable. So we talked a little bit also about the fact that, you know, this is a very forgiving install. I mean, really your connections from mat to mat and then back to the transformers themselves are where the critical installation accuracy has to happen, but the elements themselves can take a lot of abuse. Uh, you can actually vary the burial depth of this product. I mean, just like you could with an MI cable or a constant watt cable mat, um, you know, you can all, all go all the way down to eight inches, which is, you know, it seems very unusual because that's a tremendous amount of thermal mass you've got to heat through, you know, uh, to get that heat up to the surface. But again, it's more of a factor over time. I mean, if somebody started their low voltage system, you know, at the end of November, because they know, hey, you know, snow could be coming in December, you, you don't really care if it takes you four days to heat up as long as you're not getting snowfall in those four days. So, but to maintain it is a whole lot less energy over time. Um, you know, versus using something like an MI on a quick start, okay? So again, roof and gutter, that's a, that's a nice picture below that shows you, you know, exactly how this system works when we're edging uh, a roof and gutter job, let's say. All right, so heat cable controls. Um, heat cable controls themselves, like I said, I'm gonna condense this down because you could, you could spend all day just talking about the controls themselves, but just know that these can go from single circuit all the way up to full blown, you know, fried and dyed, we like to call them panels with full breaker integration. And they'll tell you about everything you need to know every five seconds, okay? Um, the connection points are really critical though, okay? Power connection kits, you know, uh, they're starting to, to really, I guess, grow in, in, in technical uh, terms, in terms of making, want to, of wanting to make a product that is a lot more goof proof, let's put it that way, during the installation. The quick connects are generally going to be a lot more expensive than a standard power connection box, but they take a lot of risk out of the install itself because these you simply feed the cut end of the cable into that quick connect barrel 
and uh, provided the installer you know puts the system together again correctly which the directions are very easy to follow they can simply crank down on these connectors and there's small knives inside of them that will actually cut into the bus on the cable itself to ensure a proper connection and it takes way less time than actually pulling off a, a quality power connection out in the field i mean i would say for a, a power connection or a splice you're probably looking at a, a good half hour to make a really clean one so this can be a big time saver on a job um, thermostats also for a single circuit run can be both <clears throat> where your power comes into and where your heat cable comes out of okay so you can use that as your power connection device on single circuit runs okay but just remember that per NEC code, we've got to have a GFI means of GFI protection on that circuit. So, of course, you know, when you've got simplistic, simplistic controls all the way up to, <clears throat> you know, very advanced controls, your prices are going to range all over the map. So, I mean, you can go from 100 bucks to, you know, tens of thousands of dollars into some of these panels. OK, but again, it's what's the application and what is the best fit for that application and what the customer is trying to do. The PLC panels are really slick from the standpoint of they do save a lot of labor during the installation. So if we're looking at a multi-circuit job, you know, instead of having to bring over each circuit itself, you can literally just bring like say one big 200 amp feed right into the panel and it does all the distributing itself. So yes, you paid $20,000 more, let's say for the panel, but you might've just knocked out 20,000 or $30,000 worth of labor to do it all, you know, wiring wise and bring all those conduits over. So it is definitely something worth considering when you're looking at multi-circuit applications. Uh, these panels also will have, you know, GFI protections in them, and again, alarms, uh, BMS plugins. So, you know, it, they do provide a very good value for what they do. Um, what is very popular nowadays too are digital thermostats. Okay, these are a lot more accurate. They're RTD controlled, so your your accuracy is within one to two degrees, whereas something like a bimetal you know, could be a plus minus two or three degrees. So for not a few bucks mo more, I mean, it's, it, you know, you, you could be talking the difference between the 150 and a $200 stat to have a better digital version um, that's gonna be a, a lot more accurate and probably a lot more reliable. Um, but with pipe tracing applications, we wanna get that bulb and capillary stat. We want the bulb on the skin of the pipe if, if we can, okay? When we turn things on just using ambient temperature, you know, uh, that ambient temperature may only be sticking around for a day, which isn't enough, let's say, for a pipe with insulation on it for it to freeze. You wouldn't lose typically enough heat for it to be a problem. But, you know, it really just kind of depends on, on what the designer is looking for and how they want the system to react. Um, you know, roof and gutter controls, typically the best way to do these as well is something that detects both moisture and temperature. So that if you have a zero degree day outside and there's no snow out, there's no moisture, you're not running your system. And then conversely, if it was say 40 degrees out and raining, you know, you're not running the system either where there's no threat for freeze. But in any of these instances, okay, the sensor only knows what it's up against. So placement of where you're gonna put those sensors is a big deal. When we look at these multi-circuit controls, we just talked a little bit about some of these bigger panels. Okay, there's a couple of ways to do that. It's both with the fully integrated uh, panels that are, that come with breakers, you know, they're all GFI equipped the whole nine yards. But a contactor relay is also a multi-circuit controller, okay? And these are very simple just from the standpoint of you're bringing over say three or four circuits to a contactor relay that has GFI protection in it. And all it's doing is waiting for a signal from a controller to tell it to close the contacts and allow power to pass. So these are a lot more economical, um, you know, so again, if, if you have a customer uh, or somebody that does not have the interest in, in you know paying somewhere between say six and who knows how many thousand dollars for a, a fully integrated panel versus you know hey i can spend 2500 for a contactor relay because it's only a few circuits it's a very acceptable and very popular way to do the controls uh for you know a sidewalk system or a snow melt system contactor relay panels are very popular and they're all over the place the thing about those contactor relays though is that you do have to bring over each separate circuit to them so it does require a bit more labor uh, versus just bringing in one single feed so we're going to cover installation specs briefly i know we're getting uh close on the time so we just want to make sure that a few things you know come to light you know before you leave here is 
you know, when we're when we're looking at installation, uh, being proactive, uh, especially when we're designing the specs for these for these projects. You know, I mean, be specific uh, because really, when when it comes down to it, I mean, you know, there are some installers that do have uh, a lot of experience with these systems, and there's some that don't. And in fairness to them, if you leave the option up there to their discretion, I mean, they're typically going to take the path of least resistance. So. Uh, you know, some of the things that, that, that we really, really uh, try hard to make sure on the specs is making sure that these cable runs are being tested uh, before, during, and after installation. I mean, one great way to ensure the fact that the heat cable is not the problem on the job is that when the material shows up on the job site, you know, to just take a picture of it, uh, test it with an ohm meter and, a, and, and uh, with a mega ohm meter and then with a resistance meter and just record those down on a, on a sheet okay and then do it again as say you're putting a self-regulating cable on a pipe before the insulators come and put insulation and cladding over the top of it you know put that mega on it again make sure that the cable is not leaking to ground um you know before they come in and put another thirty thousand dollars worth of services over the top of that cable concrete pours it's critical okay because once that concrete dries it's done it's over so you know, making sure that we're testing that cable during the process is, is a very important uh, thing to note. But, it, it, you know, a lot of it really comes down to the preparation before the job. It's, you know, are we all reading through the install manuals? You know, some of those things out in the field that if you're not familiar with installing these systems, you know, put your hand up. I mean, folks like us are more than happy to answer your questions and make sure that the job goes off right to begin with. Uh, because we will find that, you know, most installers uh, engineers, specifiers, installers, and customers that, you know, it's kind of like once you get through the first couple, if you've ever made a mistake on them, they are very easy to install. So, it, it, you know, it's a solution that makes a lot of sense. There's a very low risk, you know, attributed to it if you're just going through a couple of those important protocols, like mega testing these cables very consistently to ensure that they're not damaged before concrete dries or, or, or insulation goes over that pipe, okay? Uh, here's a couple of tips on the slide, though, that I'm sure you're probably reading through, um, you know, with roof and gutter de-icing, you know, uh, you know, really, it's, it's it's pretty standard stuff, you know, as far as being able to engineer the best system that we can help you engineer with it, um, you know, but I would definitely make it a requirement for testing to be done on the cables during, you know, before, during, and after the time of installation, and even to do factory startups, um, you know, that's another nice, you know, tip to put in there where, again, uh, you know, the installer can get the entire project finished up and then we send in a specialist at the very end, let's say, to go through a checklist to make sure that all the connections have been done, been done correctly. Um, you know, we've mega ohmed all the cables, all of them have had a resistance reading done to them so that when we know, so we know at the end of that, that process that the job was installed correctly because, uh, you know, let's face it, on job sites, there can be tons of people on that job site and, uh, you know, for the installer to have that the assurance that they've done it correctly could save them a lot of time and money, you know, confusion down the road. If something were to go sideways, he's got that backup. Okay. So, you know, a lot of what we just talked about, again, I'm, I'm not keeping up quite as well with the slides here, but uh, there's a lot of emphasis on that mega. Ohm, okay. So if, if people are not familiar with it, the, the upper picture there, that, that blue device is a simple mega tester, you know, 500 or a thousand BDC is uh, certainly uh, good enough to do a heat cable test with, but this is really your best uh, cover your rear end policy that you can do as an installer uh, to ensure that everything you're putting on the pipe is good. Um, and then of course we've got a clamp meter and you know you can design your own recording sheet. Uh, we have recording sheets that we can provide for you at the time of install so that you know you're keeping all your data in check. And these are also critical too for your warranties and for maintaining your warranties. So you know, please don't disregard that portion of it because uh, if you do not have mega ohm readings, resistance readings, and the dates that it was installed, the manufacturers are typically not going to um, uh, comply with your warranty. Um, so it is critical, you know, to make sure that that, that information is submitted. So, um, you know, if anything, we're all running parallel roads. I mean, this is really the end of the presentation at this point, and and. You know, I think that the better communication we all have on the front side of these projects, a lot, they, they go much smoother. And, you know, it, it really limits the amount of profit robbing comeback visits, you know, or having to address problems on the backside 
when nobody wants to and just move on to the next project. I mean, we're, you know, we're all running similar parallel lines. So, um, so we're here to help you, you know, when it comes down to, uh, to these applications. And I really appreciate your time uh, spending with us today. Um, I know we might've gone a couple of minutes over here, but uh, thank you again. If you have any questions also, you know, please make sure that, you know, you're submitting those in on, on the pane and, and, and we will get um, answers back to you shortly. Thank you.